Right. Welcome everyone to the 2011 National African American History Month Read-In. Um, it's really exciting to know that uh, we're participating in a national event. Uh, people, about a million people across the country uh, are participating in this uh, read-in event this month. And the purpose of the event is to commemorate Black History Month, but also to promote literacy across the country. Um, and what uh, it the event originally started uh, with the National uh, Council of Teachers of English, and it's also sponsored by the International Reading Association. Uh, here at BCC, uh, the event has been sponsored by the African American History Month Committee, as well as the M Multicultural Committee. Um, and again, what's going to happen basically is uh, an open invitation to anyone who wants to read uh, from uh, a piece of uh, literature written by an African American writer. It could be a short poem, it could be an excerpt from a famous speech, or a, a part of an essay that you like. There are some reading packets up here at the front. You can uh, browse through those and select something. Or if you don't want to participate, you can also just sit back and listen. There is a sign-in sheet going around. Everybody does have to sign in because, as I said, this is a national event. I do have to report a number of people participating. And you may have an instructor who's uh, giving you extra credit for being here. And uh, this is one way to let your instructor know that you did participate. And we have Dr. Sprager here with us today, the president of our college, who's going to perhaps read something? <laughs> OK. All right, well, maybe if you want to, you can participate. Um, I'm going to start off the event by reading uh, something, sh two short little poems by, um, one is by Langston Hughes, and the other one is Nikki Giovanni. Uh, both of them have to do with the idea of dreams. Uh, the first one you may be familiar with, it's a pretty uh, highly anthologized poem that many people already know. And the other one is not so, uh, so well known, but the, both, both the poets are quite uh, famous. So the first one is called Harlem by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over, like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? OK, dreams. The other one is called Dreams by Nikki Giovanni. I used to dream militant dreams of taking over America to show th these white folks how it should be done. I used to dream radical dreams of blowing everyone away with my perceptive powers of correct analysis. I even used to think I'd be the one to stop the riot and negotiate the peace. Then I awoke and dug that if I dreamed natural women doing what a woman does when she's natural, I would have a revolution. So that's Nikki Giovanni. I thought that was an appropriate uh, poem for these times, especially what, considering what's happening in Egypt, the revolution taking place. And uh, here we have Nikki Giovanni talking about one of her personal revolution. Um, at this time, I'd like to open it up to anyone who would like to read something. Uh, and we have a reader. That's great. Uh, would you like to come up here and uh it, um, It's by Claude McKay, and it's called If We Must Die. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while round us back the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our cursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us through dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What thou before us lies the open grave? Like men will face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. 
There you are. You want your book? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that. Claude McKay, another well-known poet. Anyone else uh, who would like to read? I know I have two of my own students who were interested in reading. Um, if you want to come up now. OK, I'm going to read um, an excerpt from a speech by Frederick Douglass. Let me give you a word of the philosophy of reform. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to our august claims have been born of earnest struggle. The conflict has been exciting, agitating, all absorbing, and for the time being, putting other all tumults to silence. It must do this or it does nothing. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. In the light of these ideas, Negroes will be hunted at the North and held and flogged at the South so long as they submit to those devilish outrages and make no resistance, either moral or physical. Men may not get all they pay for in this world, but they must certainly pay for all they get. If we ever get free from the oppressions and wrongs heaped upon us, we must pay for their removal. We must do this by labor, by suffering, by sacrifice, and if needs be, by our lives and the lives of others. Thank you. One line that sticks out is, uh, there, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. And that, I think, is a line that we can all sort of, it probably resonates with many students, right? If there's no struggle to get to the end, there's not going to be a, any progress. <laughs> Short. Um, I'm singing a poem by Maya Angelou, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wings in the orange sun rays and dares to climb the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom, can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied so he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but long for still and his tune is heard on the distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze and the trade winds soft through the singing trees and the fat worms waiting on the dawn bright lawn and he names the sky his own. But a cage bird stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow, sh his shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied so he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird, s the cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still and his tune is heard on the distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom. If you're just walking in, there is a sign uh, in sheet uh, going around. Please make sure that you, your name is on there. Uh, anyone else interested in uh, reading? Maybe a short poem? Uh, there is a reading packet up here if you would like to look, look through that to select something to read. Doesn't have to be too long. The Good Book. The Freedman's Third Reader was a school textbook created to teach former slaves how to read. It also served as a historical text through which freedmen and freedwomen learned about notable African Americans and Abraham Lincoln. The book conveyed Christian values and the word of God. It was a wonderful sight. Men, women, and children learning to read. They studied in dimly lit cabins, writing their alphabets and straining to read about the light of a fire. They stole moments to read their lessons as they rode on the wagons that took them to the fields. They taught the old. 
the elders reminded the young of the value of an education. One freedman from Mississippi stated that hundreds of former slaves believed, if I never does nothing more while I live, I shall give my children the chance to go to school. Hi, I'm Deborah Anderson. Uh, I teach English here. Um, what I'd like to read uh, today is a piece from a story called Sonny's Blues by James Baldwin. Um, the story takes place in Harlem in about the 1950s. And it's about two brothers. And uh, one brother wants to be a jazz musician, a piano player. And his, the, the other brother uh, is an algebra teacher. And he's sort of afraid for his brother and sort of afraid for the kind of life he's going to have or, or in essence does have because he, he suffers quite a bit and he uh, is a victim of drug addiction and the two brothers are on very different paths. But at the climax of the story, um, the narrator, who's a, the algebra teacher brother, uh, goes to see his musician brother play music. And it's really the only time that he's able to understand what his brother's been trying to tell him. And he's trying to understand his brother's life. And um, I think it's the reason that I wanted to share it was because um, I think it's a beautiful piece of writing, but also because it can show what the power of art can do, whether it's music or literature or another kind of art. Um, and I think that's something we should maybe think a little bit more about sometimes in our culture. And the piano player's name is uh, Sonny. They all gathered around Sonny, and Sonny played. Every now and again, one of them seemed to say, Amen. Sonny's fingers filled the air with life, his life. But that life contained so many others. And Sonny went all the way back. He really began with the spare, flat statement of the opening phrase of the song. Then he began to make it his. It was very beautiful because it wasn't hurried and it was no longer a lament. It seemed to hear with what burning he had made it his and what burning he had yet to make it ours. How we could cease lamenting. Freedom lurked around us and I understood at last that he could help us to be free if we would listen. That he would never be free until we did. Yet there was no battle in his face now. I heard what he had gone through and would continue to go through until he came to rest in the earth. He had made it his, that long line of which he knew only mama and daddy. And he was giving it back, as everything must be given back, so that passing through death, it can live forever. I saw my mother's face again and felt for the first time how the stones of the road she had walked on must have bruised her feet. I saw the moonlit road where my father's brother died, and it brought something else back to me and carried me past it. I saw my little girl again and felt Isabel's tears again, and I felt my own tears begin to rise. And I was yet aware that this was only a moment, that the world waited outside as hungry as a tiger, and that trouble stretched above us longer than the sky. Upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans. And I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. Because I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like these rivers. What I'm reading is a poem called Corner Meeting. Ladder, flag, and amplifier, what the soapbox used to be. The speaker catches fire looking at their faces. His words jump down the stand in listeners' places. This one's a poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was an African-American writer during the Reconstruction period. Um, he used poetic resonance of folk life and culture in many of his best-known poems. 
Uh, he was a uh, son of an ex-slave. Uh, the poem that I'm reading, let's see, let's do, let's do this one. Um, it's called We Wear the Mask. It was uh, written in 1896. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile, with torn and bleeding hearts we smile, and mouth with mir mirrored subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but, O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but, O oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. The many readings being held across the country, a million readers participate in this. And here at BCC, this event is sponsored by uh, the African American History Month Committee and Multicultural Committee. And the, the way to participate is pretty simple. If you have something to read, uh, you have a short poem or an excerpt from a story or a speech, please feel free to come up and read it. If you would like to read but you don't have any reading material with you, we do have reading packets here. We've got some great anthologies that you could flip through to look for something. Uh, and I am going to be passing around a sign-in sheet. I do need to keep numbers to report this, okay? I read two poems to start off, and I'm just gonna read one of them again for those of us who, uh, those of you who just walked in. This is by Nikki Giovanni, and it's called Dreams. Um, and I picked this one because as I was telling uh, some of the students earlier, because of what's happening uh, currently in the world with the revolution happening in Egypt, I thought it was quite uh, appropriate to pick this one. I used to dream militant dreams of taking over America to show these white folks how it should be done. I used to dream radical dreams of blowing everyone away with my perceptive powers of correct analysis. I even used to think I'd be the one to stop the riot and negotiate the peace. Then I awoke and dug that if I dreamed natural dreams of being a natural woman, doing what a woman does when she's natural, I would have a revolution. Okay. Grandpa's stories. The pictures on the television do not make me dream as well as the stories without picture. Grandpa knows how to tell. Even if he does not know what makes a spaceship go, Grandpa says back in time, hamburgers cost a dime, Ice cream costs in nickels and a penny for a pickle. All right. Oh, Hi, everybody. This one's called The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and old as the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me, me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New, New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Um, and by an anonymous, anonymous poet called uh, Motherless Child, Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long ways from home, a long ways from home. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. A long ways from home, a long ways from home. Sometimes I feel like a feather in the air. Sometimes I feel like a feather in the air. Sometimes I feel like a feather in the air. And I spread my wings and I fly. I spread my wings and I fly. This poem is called Relief. My heart is aching for them for them Poles and Greeks on relief 
way across the sea because I was on relief once in 1933. I know what relief can be. It took me two years to get on WPA. If the war hadn't come along, I wouldn't be out the barrel yet. Now I'm almost back in the barrel again. To tell the truth, if these white folks want to go ahead, off that subway bench tonight with the evening post for cover. Come on out, oh that flop house, stop shivering your guts out all day on street covers under the L. Jesus, aren't you tired yet? So this is working, okay. Um, I chose a poem, I don't know if, if you've done it yet. It's um, the Langston Hughes poem, Harlem, Dream Deferred. Yep. Sure. It's okay to do it again. The reason that, um, this is one of my favorite poems um, by Langston Hughes, who was a huge um, po poetry figure in the Harlem Renaissance. His dates are 1902 to 1967. And um, the reason, um, he's particularly important is that my grandmother, when she was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, went to hear a reading of Langston Hughes. He was reading aloud, his poetry aloud, and she got his uh, autograph, and she just said that he was just a lovely, lovely man, and she got to meet him in person, so I thought that was pretty cool. And we do, the family, my, my grandmother has since passed away, but we have the, the um, autograph somewhere. So this is one of my favorites by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? A paragraph from Malcolm X's speech delivered in 1964 to a group of young teenage civil rights activists. One of the first things I think young people, especially nowadays, should learn is how to see for yourself and listen for yourself and think for yourself. Then you can come to an intelligent decision for yourself. If you form the habit of going by what you hear others say about someone or going by what others think about someone, Instead of searching that thing out for yourself and seeing for yourself, you will be walking west when you think you're going east. And you will be walking east when you think you're going west. This generation, especially of our people, has a burden, more so than any other time in history. The most important thing that we can learn to do today is think for ourselves. Okay, the name of this poem is Mother to Son. Well, son, I'll tell you. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters, and boards turn up, and places with no carpet on the floor, bar. But all the time, I's been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and, some things, and sometimes going in the dark, where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't turn back. Don't you set down on the steps. It's the 22nd National African American Read-In. Um, and this is an event that's being held across the country. P uh, people read from a favorite uh, piece of literature, a piece of poem, an excerpt from a speech, or an essay that they like. Uh, and if anybody's interested in reading, uh, please feel free to come up and do your, uh, you know, do your reading. I know, Diane, your class has uh, come prepared prepared to read from a uh, speech of Martin Luther King. And um, if you would like, you can come up now and do that. Hi, my name is Olga. I'm from Estonia. And I will read a poem, Earth Song. It's an earth song, and I've been waiting long for an earth song. It's a spring song, and I've been waiting long for a spring song. Strong as the bursting of young buds, 
strong as the shoots of a new plant, strong as the coming of the first child from its mother's womb. An earth sunk, a body sunk, a spring sunk, and I've been waiting long for an earth sunk. Thank you. My name is Romira Rodriguez. I'm from Cape Verde. I too sing in America. I am the dark brother they sent me to eat in the kitchen. When company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be eating the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they will see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too an America. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Nasif Yunan. I'm from Egypt. I know everybody now knows about Egypt. Uh. Hello, everybody. I'm Willie. I'm from Haiti. Hi, my name is Jean Trifil Parisian. I'm from Haiti. Hello, my name is Fito Belize. I'm from Haiti. So I'm gonna start the first part. Uh, and so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It's a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day the nation will be raised up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evidence that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together in the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of operation, will be transferred into an oasis of the freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they, they will be not be in judgment by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. I have a dream. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with his vicious wishes, with his governor having his lip dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill on mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be relieved and all flesh shall be see it together. This is our hope, and this is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to you out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope, 
With this faith, we will be able to transform the jungling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhoods. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. And this will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom win from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom win from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom win from the hill high name Alleghenies. Let freedom win from the snow caps, Rockies of Colorado. But not only that, let freedom win from Storm Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom win from Look out mountain of Tennessee, let freedom win from every hill and more hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom win. And when this happens, when we allow freedom win, when we let it win from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sign the words of the old, of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thanks God, Almighty, we are free at last. Class for delivering that speech in such a moving and inspiring way. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite any other um, per, uh, members from the audience who would like to read from something that you like. If you want, there is a, a packet of readings over here that you can select from. It could be a short poem or an excerpt from a speech. It could be something that has already been read. Special bulletins. Lower the flags for the dead become alive. Play hillbilly dirges that hooded serpents may dance. Write obituaries for white robbed warriors. Emerging the warfare of death rattles. Muffle drums in Swanee River tempo. Hand high salutes hail. Present arms with axe handles made in Atlanta, zig hail. O oh, run all who have not changed your names as for others, the skin on your black face. Peel off the skin, peel, peel, peel off the skin. Okay, I'm gonna read Helen Keller. She in the dark light, in the dark found light, brighter than many ever see. She within herself found loveliness through the soul's own mastery. And now the world receives from her dower the message of the strength of inner power. Hi, everybody. All right, I'm reading Things in Dixie. It's not enough to mourn and not enough to pray. Sackcloth and ashes, anyhow, save for another day. The Lord God himself would hardly desire that men be burned to death and blessed to fire. You clean a while. When white collars get done, you have your fun. Cleaning a while, but just wait, child. That's it. Um. 
Aunt Sue has a red full of stories. Aunt Sue has a whole heart full of stories. Summer nights on the pro front porch, Aunt Sue cuddles a brown-faced child to her bosom and tell him stories. Black, black slaves working in the hot sun and black slaves walk in the dewy night and black, black slave sing a sorrow song and banks of the May River mango, mingle themselves softly in the flow of all the Aunt Sue boys. Mingle themselves softly in the dark shadow of cross and recross, Aunt Sue stories. And the dark-faced child listening knows that Aunt Sue's stories were, were are real stories. He knows that Aunt Sue never got her stories out of any book at all, but that they came right out of her own life. They, the dark-faced child is quiet of a summer night listen to Aunt Sue's stories. The painful at all. Um, as I was saying earlier, think about how great it's gonna feel afterwards because it feels awesome to be able to have done, participated in this uh, read-in, just like a million people across the country are doing. Yes. Um, I'm gonna read Birmingham Sunday. Four little girls who went to Sunday school that day and never came back home at all, but instead left their blood upon the wall with splattered flesh and bloodied Sunday dresses torn to shreds by dynamite that China made eons ago. Did not know what chi that, chi that what China made before China was ever read at all would redden with their blood this Birmingham on Sunday wall. Four tiny girls who left their blood upon that wall and little graves today await the dynamite that might ignite the fuse of centuries of dragon kings whose tomorrow sings a hymn the missionaries never taught Chinese in Christian Sunday school to implement the golden rule. Four little girls might be awakened someday soon by songs upon the breeze and as yet unfelt among magnolia trees. Okay, this poem sort of goes along with one of the other ones that another reader read about the uh, bombing of the Birmingham church. Um, it's called Ballad of Bur Birmingham on the bombing of a church in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. Mother, dear mother, may I go downtown instead of out to play and march the streets of Birmingham in a freedom march today? No, baby, no, you may not go, for the dogs are fierce and wild, and the clubs and hoses, guns and jails aren't good for a little child. But mother, I won't be alone. Other children will go with me and march the streets of Birmingham to make our country free. No, baby, no, you may not go, for I fear those guns will fire. But you may go to church instead and sing in the children's choir. She has combed and brushed her dark, blue, br dark hair and bathed rose petals sweet and drawn white gloves on her small br brown hands and white shoes on her feet. The mother smiled to know her child was in a sacred place, but that smile was the last smile to come upon her face. But when she heard the explosion, her eyes grew wet and wild. She raced through the streets of Birmingham calling for her child. She clawed through bits of glass and brick, then lifted out a shoe. Oh, here's the shoe my baby wore, but baby, where are you? That was a sad poem. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Anyone want to share? Come on, you can do it. Got a reader. All right. See, we have people going over again and again. That's great. Okay, this one's called Relief. My heart is aching for them Poles and Greeks on relief way across the seas because I was on relief once in 1933. I know that relief can be it took me two years to get on WPA. If the war hadn't come along, I wouldn't be out the barrel yet. 
Now, I'm almost back in the barrel again. To tell the truth, if these white folks want to go ahead off that subway bench tonight with the evening post for cover, come on out, old that flop house. Stop shivering your guts out all day on street corners under the L. Jesus, ain't you tired yet? Get this to your Egyptian student. Um, it's called Dreams by Nikki Giovanni. I used to dream militant dreams of taking over America to show these white folks how it should be done. I used to dream radical dreams of blowing everyone away with my perceptive powers of correct analysis. I even used to think I'd be, I'd be the one to stop the riot and negotiate the peace. Then I awoke and dug that if I dreamed natural dreams of being a natural woman, doing what a woman does when she's natural, I would have a revolution. <laughs> 